Oh, just look at that. It's really hard. I'm not a model. <laughs> very difficult with all the pictures. And who's who's sitting in each room? Do you have a chair? Okay, welcome, uh, colleagues. Good morning. Second to last day uh, for the COP, and particularly after the uh, food day yesterday, uh, a very important session today. I think one of the ones which are very critical in the transformation of our food systems going forward, but really looking at the nexus uh, with water, climate, and food. So my name's are Sarah Mbagobunu, and in today's session, we're looking at digital innovations for climate resilient agriculture, a pathway to sustainable food systems. And I'm excited to be here today with our esteemed panelists. But perhaps before I start, just a few uh, opening remarks and setting of the scene. Um, thank you for being here for the event to showcase the importance of partnership through IFAD's work to enhance rural people's individual and collective resilience, including an embedding gender sensitive approaches. As we face unprecedented climate challenges, it is important to recognize the role of digital innovations in revolutionizing agriculture. And by that, we mean really transformation of, 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 of food systems. These technologies are pivotal enablers, helping optimize resource use, enhance productivity, and also empower smallholder farmers all at the same time. The objective of the event is to showcase how digital tools such as mobile apps, GIS, and remote sensing are critical in supporting climate smart agriculture. We aim to highlight their role in improving decision making and resilience among farmers in the global uh, south. A special emphasis of our discussion today will be on empowering all farmers, including women and youth with real time information, market access and financial services. So how do we bundle all those, all those aspects, all those essential ecosystem um, services on, in apps, on platforms? We look forward to uh, insightful presentations and discussions focusing on both the innovation and innovative applications of digital technologies in IFAD funded projects and in the broader challenges and opportunities in digital transformation for agriculture going forward. As we all know, it's really critical that we are able to full, fill our plates sustainably uh, in the future of food, and as well as looking at the same time, a triple return in introducing different financing streams in the food systems transformation agenda. So this is very exciting. Uh, so I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce a very experienced uh, and rich panel. Um, so I would just like to start uh, in no, uh, no specific order. And I think we have today about five or six panelists who are willing to share their experiences with us. So very quickly, uh, Mr. Sujit Jadaran, I hope I spelled your last name uh, properly, Chief Customer Marketing Officer in Cropin. Frank Martin, SREFT, European Space Agency, I hope you're here. Um, then we have Ali uh, Abu Saba, Regional Director for the Central and West Asia and North Africa, uh, Director of the International Center for Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas, ICADA, if you know that uh, acronym. And then Professor Aldin Yuxel, representing the DG of Forestry. Mr. Hedges Tembo, Chief Green Economy Officer, Ministry of Green Economy and Environment in Zambia. And finally, Mr. Alex Wainika, Senior m and &E and Knowledge Management Officer of the case of Kral uh, IFAD Finance Project in, in, in Kenya. So I'd like to, with that, welcome all the panelists. And I think we start immediately and we move on to the first presentation of our day, where we invite um, the European Space Agency, I think it is, to share with us a presentation on measuring the impacts of afforestation and terracing in, in, in Turkey. So I'd just like to hand over the floor uh, to Mr. Clement Mathau Jack for the European Space Agency. Are you, is, is he here? 
Okay, it doesn't look like he has come in. So maybe we can go to the second presentation. And I don't know if he is here. The presentation is around the precision agriculture in Kenya. And I'd like to invite Mr. Alex Wainika, Senior m and &E and KM Office of Akesa Kral, if he is present. It seems both our presenters are not here. Zira, are they are they connected? Which one is this? Is this the case? Um, uh, Alex? Okay. Okay, two minutes to get the slide up. Can we have it in presentation mode, please? Okay, over to you, Alex. Go ahead. Okay, good morning, and uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm um, Alex Maniki, uh, uh, presenting the, the experience for inclusive integrated uh, digital tools for enhancing uh, small order resilience in Kenya. Uh, so the case of Kral, uh, has a uh, been a while, uh, it has been a, a project which had been uh, started uh, some time back, now almost eight years. So we focus on reducing rural poverty and food insecurity. We also empower the counties uh, because we work with the counties as partners. And our unique um, impact, which we have already presented in the developmental uh, space, is working together with the public-private producer partnership and then the introduction of what we now refer to as the innovative e-voucher. So we target uh, uh, close to 185,000 beneficiaries. Uh, already we have already uh, clocked uh, past that target. And then a total of uh, uh, 140 uh, beneficiaries have also been issued with the innovative e-voucher. So we've been uh, alluded for uh, uh, phasing out the paper, the paper voucher we moved to card uh, to the debit card and now to the mobile card uh, to the mobile e voucher the project is uh, funded is not funded with the GOK EU EFAD ASAP the financial institutions and the beneficiaries also contribute uh, uh, a part of the required contribution we have a, a value chain approach where we start by supporting the increased productivity and uh, working out on the natural resource management the resilience building at this uh, intervention uh, space is the key aspect, and food and nutrition forms uh, the key element because we need to graduate these farmers from the subsistence to uh, the commercial oriented. Then we have a post harvest because uh, we will get a lot of produce. You need to make sure that the produce is minimized, it's marketed, markets are efficient, and uh, the, the farmers now get returns to their investment. Then uh, all this sits in the financial inclusion uh, efficiency of accessing the farm inputs uh, through the e-voucher. Then to, to tie this together, we've now um, uh, inc uh, incorporated the GAUS, uh, which is a, a tool uh, introduced by EFAT to uh, provisioning, uh, for, uh, provisioning journey of the participants. So what are these integrated digital solutions we have brought on board? One is the card. Uh, we started with the card, we started with the debit card, we work with the two banks, we have the equity, we have the cooperative bank, and the key here is we petition the wallet into six, we have the farm account, uh, farmer can use that, we have the conservation agriculture, we have the seed, the fertilizer, the insurance, and then the post harvest element. So these wallets are uh, re uh, restricted, you cannot draw money across the wallet. So the moment you deposit in one wallet, then that amount is uh, utilized for that specific purpose. Then later, during COVID, we shifted now from the card and we went now to the mobile. All those wallets are now domiciled in the uh, wallet, in the mobile phone, which is a simple phone. And farmers go to get inputs, used to get to go and get inputs uh, through this uh, application using simple uh, phones. Then the other aspect is the GIS. Uh, it was a key element into planning and integrating all the interventions uh, for the program. We set what we uh, we refer to as the GIS and the remote sensing labs, or all the counties we have been working in. 
And then this facilitates planning, uh, and also it has been uh, a, a game changer in the in the lower level uh, governments because they use it as a planning tool to integrate and plan the crop suitability and other distribution of intervention for the for the project. We have also climate information, which is also very key. Uh, we have uh, the climate. You can now notice how how need uh, farmers need precise. So we do this through the meteorological department. We collect the data, transmit it to the central server. Then this data, when it's received to that central uh, data point, it's now downscaled and now given as advisory messages to the farmers to utilize it and plan appropriately in the season they're in. This one is disseminated to the rural households for planning. It build all this because then we have now realized that there's a lot of knowledge coming out from all over. We have now tied this up into one house, which we are now referring to the integrated knowledge management hub. So here we are all seeing uh, two, all the interventions that have been, uh, we have been able to innovate into a depository and a retrieval uh, element. So you can, this one can be found uh, through that link. We'll be sharing this. Then we also use digital tools because when we do interventions, we need now to collect the data and uh, now analyze and, uh, and then give feedback for future planning. So we do online data collection. We are now also doing the big data and warehousing and the document management and the data integration. Okay. So then what has now all this led to? Uh, this one, uh, the use of digital tools uh, has led to uh, rural uh, enhanced rural resilience is a tool we, in, uh, we, we, we developed together with the IFAD and it is now under the second phase. Uh, we've now realized uh, an enhanced resilience of above 20% of our beneficiaries. Then it reduced rural poverty, market efficiencies, and then there's also income and well-being. And then yields have been have, uh, increased by over 50% across all, all the four promoted value chains. And that can be witnessed through the farmers we are now seeing on the photo. So we are happy when the farmer is happy. Then uh, thank you for, for listening to me. Back to you. So thank you very much, Alex, for being so succinct and, and sharing the Kenya case uh, so well. I would like the participants here to write down their questions, hold any questions, as we move straight to the second uh, presentation, uh, and then you'll have an opportunity to present or ask any questions uh, during and after our panel uh, discussion. So uh, let's put up the second presentation, please. So here we have uh, Frank Martin, who is now connected as well online. And uh, oh, he's actually present here. OK. <laughs> Frank, welcome. I was looking for you earlier on. So uh, and he's going to share the integrated environmental impact assessment. Please, please come. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm Frank Martin Seifert, uh, working at the European Space Agency uh, in its Earth Observation Center in Frascati, south of Rome, Italy. And I'm going to present you what a space agency is doing and then specifically what we're doing related to resilience. Our vision related to uh, uh, observing the Earth is taking the pulse of our planet. Working, not working. working. But it should rotate and show them. No. No. Okay, there was an there was an animation that doesn't matter. Uh, we are looking at the environment. We are looking at uh, at changes in the environment. We are looking at change uh, effects of changes of climate change. 
We are doing this with a fleet of satellite data currently. We're having 14 operational uh, satellites up in orbit. Uh, the most important, and I think the ones which uh, uh, where you should be familiar with is the Copernicus uh, system, the Sentinels, uh, which we are developing with the European uh, Commission. Uh, but we're having as well meteorological satellites that goes back to the 70s, which we are developing with and for UMITSAT. Uh, and we have specific scientific missions uh, to look at uh, very uh, uh, specific uh, scientific questions related to the Earth system. Related to the Sentinels, we're having seven Sentinels up uh, in orbit uh, now uh, working. Unfortunately, one of those uh, stopped working uh, about two years ago. That was Sentinel-1B, a radar satellite. We're having high-resolution uh, multispectral, that is Sentinel-2, uh, Sentinel Sentinel-3, medium resolution, which gives almost daily coverage uh, of the globe. Uh, we're having Sentinel-4 and 5, which are in the pipeline, Sentinel-5P, <coughs> Uh, atmospheric satellite uh, is providing already information of the atmosphere and Sentinel-6 is uh, an altimeter uh, to uh, provide information on the, uh, uh, on the sea. But, with, and, but this is not the only thing what we, are, uh, uh, what we are having within this Copernicus, let's say, universe. We are cooperating uh, Europe and globally with other space agencies to give you, this community, the best possible data sets to analyze uh, uh, mitigation activities, support adaptation activities, look at loss and damage, uh, provide an independent data set uh, towards the community and the best of it. Uh, it's all uh, free of charge for everybody. Currently, we are giving uh, 300 terabytes of, uh, per, uh, we are uh, distributing 300 terabytes per day uh, uh, towards the overall community. But now, let's come towards application of these satellites. That's what we are, why we are uh, joined here together. And that's about uh, climate resilience. Uh, we're having a, uh, some, a dedicated program to support uh, the development uh, the development sector that is with the international uh, financial institutions uh, called GD, uh, GDA and out of this there's a project uh, related to climate resilience and I'm reporting uh, to you a bit about this uh, this project it's a uh, Murat River uh, watershed re rehabilitation project uh, and uh, the Murat River uh, in uh, Turkey. Uh, it is about uh, to improve the livelihoods uh, through the uh, rehabilitation and sustainable use of uh, natural assets uh, f for uh, the population living in this watershed. Uh, there's a lot of degraded land and we are trying to monitor the rehabilitation of this degraded land related to the vegetation, water resources, uh, and, uh, and uh, hoping uh, to see poverty uh, reduction. The, uh, the, project, the project groups group is composed of uh, uh, poor rural, uh, rural people living in this uh, uh, catchment area uh, with an em emphasis on women and, uh, and the poorest households. We are trying to support really the, uh, uh, the uh, most vulnerable uh, in this area. We are supporting to manage resources, to feed livestock, collect fire, uh, firewood, and obtain water for household and irrigation, uh, uh, ir irrigation pur purpose. It should result in higher income within the region, should reduce household expenditures uh, for uh, uh, expenditures related to energy, related to, uh, to, uh, to water consumption, uh, and uh, reduce negative impacts from erosion, flash floods, and landslides. Overall, we are looking for improvement in the resource management within this area. The objectives related to the project identify the ter uh, now going more towards the, let's say technical objectives uh, out of this overall uh, identify terrace uh, areas along the area of the interest in the uh, Murat Rivershed, 
uh, quantify the area where uh, interventions should take place and assess the impact of interventions on vegetation cover, bare soil and soil moisture in a couple of pilot slides. I don't go into detail. It is just to give you an idea about the complexity, what we are, uh, what we are going, uh, uh, what, uh, how uh, the information flow uh, within uh, this project uh, goes uh, from the data processing uh, towards, uh, 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 towards fusion of data uh, and uh, finally going towards the regional and local analysis uh, of the whole uh, uh, of the uh, data set to provide uh, uh, actionable information to the people living there. So we had identified uh, overall five areas where we're looking into it. Uh, you see here uh, the area of the, uh, of the river basin uh, in the uh, eastern part of Turkey. We have selected five demonstration sites, and I'm showing, I've collected uh, information on all information sites in case you want to see uh, uh, some specific area. Uh, I'm showing you now uh, the first one, uh, land looking at soil conservation. Land use before was no forest. Uh, the intervention uh, is a mixed, uh, uh, one related to uh, terracing and uh, planting trees, and the change expected is more greener uh, areas. Uh, what you see here is a loss of uh, uh, phytostabilization uh, after the summer period, that is from 2011. Then after the intervention, the intervention took place uh, in the mid of uh, last, uh, last uh, decade. Uh, in 2020, you see all the uh, terraces. Uh, you see a slight improve of the photostabilization after uh, the summer, uh, though more green. And uh, this is uh, uh, seen here in a, uh, shown here in a plot related to the vegetation cover, which, which goes up, uh, the bare, bare soil going down, and the soil moisture uh, having a slight uh, decrease. Similar thing related to uh, the second slide. Now that uh, the second one, I should maybe go to the the third one was nice. Uh, effores, uh, that is related to afforestation. It was before a rangeland, and uh, there as well planting trees and terracing. Uh, here as well the situation before in 2014. That's all based on, land, uh, on the Landsat uh, time series provided by USGS uh, because we, uh, our Sentinels, uh, Sentinel-2, the equivalent with a better resolution, uh, the full system was operational in 2017. So not, uh, though we wouldn't have any data before the intervention. And uh, after the intervention, you see that uh, the terrace areas and uh, that's then taken from Google Earth after, and, uh, but we, we see from the analysis that the vegetation cover uh, goes up related to uh, what we see in the images, uh, uh, we, we could not identify a changes. There's still more things what we need to do. Soil moisture goes a bit down, spare soil a bit down. Uh, I showed you this example to show that not everything is so straightforward and is, uh, uh, is an easy to uh, achieve uh, uh, task. Let's go. Oh, no, that was too fast. Okay. Uh, in Let's, let's look at the uh, uh, site five, uh, as well, afforestation from rangeland planting tree and terracing. And uh, here uh, we, we see as well the effect that uh, vegetation cover goes up, uh, bare soil goes down, and uh, soil moisture uh, in this period 
stays about uh, the same. Next step, we need to conclude this impact assessment. The team got uh, just recently from IFAD uh, the additional data on uh, on uh, uh, on uh, on ground information, which needs to be. Uh, integrated, they found some inconsistencies, so there is an exchange uh, of the team uh, with the IFAD uh, team. Uh, so we need to continue the, the analysis of environmental var variables in the watersheds uh, where the project was uh, implemented and determine climate shocks in the uh, region expected between uh, uh, the last 10 years. But it doesn't stop here. Uh, Murat 2 project is, uh, uh, is uh, discussed, being in the pipeline, and the project will support, uh, the, uh, the ESA project will support the identification of environmental hotspots in the Euphrates Basin to facilitate prioritization of interventions of the project design. That's in a nutshell what, uh, from an ongoing project and uh, you, you saw the uh, analysis is not completed we would have liked to present ah that's uh, that's how we can uh, can do it and that's a straight way forward there are still things which need to be better analyzed and as well the effect will be seen only on a longer time scale but we are working on it we are supporting ifad and uh, uh, with the earth, obs uh, earth observation data uh, we uh, contribute towards the overall effort of i think everybody here in the room and uh, at cop uh, uh, overall effort uh, to uh, reduce poverty and to uh, build up climate resilience and with this thank you for your attention No, thank you very much. I just want, I know that's very exciting. Lots of questions again emerging from uh, the participants, but we will get to the Q&A session very shortly. I would just like, and this is all part of the first set of set, scene setting phase of this uh, session. The last thing I would like you to watch before we get into the panel discussions to kick off the, the, the dialogue is a short film uh, from Cropping. Uh, so I really, I don't know, uh, Sujad, if you want to come and introduce the video at all for one minute, and then we can go straight into the clip. Just your patience, just to stimulate our minds and set the scene. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Um, I represent Kropin. Um, we've been in this space called ACTEC since 2010, a time when ACTEC wasn't even a coined word. We've been pushing the whole vision and mission of can we make every single cultivable land on this planet traceable so that we can make it productive and sustainable. Uh, and it's been our uphill task. And like most of you who are either building, deploying programs, supporting programs at a grassroots level with farming communities, can easily say that driving digital adoption while critical is also a challenging one that we need to address. Um, what we'll quickly showcase in this video is just how we are making this possible as we have pivoted to thinking more like an ecosystem provider rather than just another point solution provider of technology in agriculture. Because that's how we can solve for this at planet scale together and not as individuals or, or organizations running their own, own, own uh, programs, et cetera. Uh, so that's a quick overview of the video. Uh, you can play the video, please. today acknowledged to be a global ag tech player with distinctive heft. The crop and heft has been painstakingly earned over 12 years. This multitude of expertise has enabled crop and to fuse it all into one groundbreaking new capability. A capability that promises to be the very first step in a global agricultural revolution. Introducing the world's first intelligent agriculture cloud. Crop in Cloud is specifically designed to offer a complete set of agriculture-specific capabilities with a singular objective, accelerating your business growth and bringing about rapid and far-reaching digital transformation across the global agri-ecosystem. The Crop in Cloud combines a triad of capabilities that can enable any player in the agriculture ecosystem to plug in and access the power of the cloud. The first component, Crop in Apps, 
is designed to scale digital transformation across agriculture and allied industries including forestry, commodities, as well as banking and insurance. Crop and Apps are an integrated portfolio of highly customizable apps and solutions that capture and digitize agriculture data from the farm, through the warehouse, to the fork. They also enable a range of use cases that include Climate smart adaptation, monitoring and managing deforestation, carbon emissions, regenerative agriculture, R&D trialing and management for seed production, multi-generational seed traceability, farming management and the effective application of package of practices, farmer enablement, as well as business engagement with the farmers, supply chain visibility, and risk management, crop protection, and nutrition development, both on and off the field, as well as farm to fork traceability, among others. The second component, crop and data hub, is designed to deliver the power of unified data by enabling seamless data integration for all agri-data sources like in-field farm management apps, remote Internet of Things sensor devices and drones, mechanization data from farming tools and assets, remote sensing satellite information for weather data, and many more. With Cropin's versatile data hub, you get access to structured and contextualized data from across various agri-entities and data sources, which enables correlation and analysis at scale there's more, Cropin Data Hub has pre-built advanced data frameworks to help solve challenging problems like generating cloud-free satellite imagery, boundary detection of farm plots, and segmentation of land use. The third component, Cropin Intelligence, enables access to Cropin's contextual deep learning and 22 AI models to help agribusinesses with insights and predictive intelligence around crop detection, yield estimation, irrigation scheduling, pest and disease prediction, nitrogen uptake, water stress detection, harvest date estimation, change detection, plot score, historical crop performance reports, and several more insights. Built using the world's largest crop knowledge graph, these models have been field tested and deployed worldwide, while being fine-tuned to work with a range of specific crop varieties, conditions, and locations. Put these three powerful components together, and you have a unified force that is the first of its kind in the world. It brings, to agriculture everywhere, a planning and operational prowess that the agriculture industry and all its associated value chains can now leverage in its entirety from one place and on demand. Crop and cloud is a first step towards the possibility of a significant global revolution in global agriculture. And it is not a small step. That is why crop and cloud is now open only to a few select clients like you to ensure that the most capable people get to sample its power first and unlock the world of possibilities that crop and cloud can enable. Allow us to show you how you can make the most of it. Book a demo today. So thank you very much. And I would like to hand over the next segment to Dina Sala, who is our regional director and my counterpart. Uh, uh, in IFAD. Dina, please. Thank you, Sarah. And I think, um, I hope at least you've all been stimulated by the first session. And I'm really looking forward now to our discussions as we move to the panel and to that video, which um, not only was it uh, giving us a lot of food for thought in terms of technologies that are there. But I, I really uh, enjoyed Frank's also presentation, uh, which actually shows the diversity of partners that IFAD um, works with, uh, um, you know, to basically make sure that we we have a uh, intelligent information and we have actually reliable information to be able to uh, advance our work um, in supporting smallholder rural producers. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me go straight to the panel. I think that's what you came for uh, also. And uh, I'd like to, again, in no particular order, to invite Sujit uh, Janardhanan, who is, as you've heard, is the Chief Customer and Marketing Officer at Cropin. We will also be joined um, virtually, I hope the connection is there, with uh, Professor Aladin Yukshel, who is representing Mr. Ibrahim Yuzer, who is the Deputy Director General, the Directorate General of Forestry, Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of the Turkey government. I also have the pleasure to um, call to the stage uh, Dr. Abdelaziz Nian. He is the country manager of ICARDA in the UAE, uh, coordinator of the Arabian Peninsula Regional Program. 
And um, unfortunately, we've had um, a, a, one of our panelists um, with a last minute emergency, so he could not join us. Uh, so with that, um, but I'm sure you will be very much um, indulged by our experienced uh, and rich panel. So maybe I can come and sit here so that we're, it's not an empty, empty seat. Just a quick test from uh, to see if our panelist is connecting virtually. Professor Aladdin, can you hear us? So we need now more work on that front. <laughs> Maybe he will be joining us. So again, I welcome our distinguished panelists and I welcome you all to this session. Uh, I'd like us to, to first, you know, uh, uh, remind all the panelists uh, to introduce themselves also in terms of um, a, maybe a quick fireside, as we say. Um, what makes you interested in, in this subject, in digital innovation? So just give me in, in 60 seconds, what is your interest in this subject? So I'll first start with you, uh, Dr. Abdelaziz. Well, digital technology as shown in the first presentation of Frank and of and, and, and the video, has got a huge potential for agriculture, especially for integration between south and, and, and north, and also vertically between the, uh, the policy makers and the users at the end of the day. Great, thank you. I turn to you, Sujit. For me, Dina, frankly, um, and this is from day one of me uh, joining the mandate with Cropin, has been how technology can really drive impact at planet scale and at the grassroots, uh, and something that can then sustain through generations of our farming communities. And that's how I see the possibility of digital and, and digital innovations. That's got me excited. That's why I continue to be part of the mission. Excellent. Frank, can I? bring you into this conversation. Can you tell us what excites you apart from oh, sitting in space? <laughs> well, <clears throat> from, other, uh, from our side, uh, I showed you uh, as a space agency, we are, uh, we are building satellites, we are building launchers, <laughs> and so, but we are, look, we are looking to respond to the needs of uh, mankind. We are looking to respond to the information needs with respect to climate change, with respect to environmental change, with respect uh, uh, to the needs of the people on this planet. And that's why we are building these uh, state-of-the-art satellites to understand our environment globally, on continental level, national level, down to the village, to provide additional information to the people on their livelihood. Thank you. Thanks for that. And I really appreciate you just coming on board. That was the sport of partnership. So very good. So now let me turn to you, uh, Sujit. As, um, from your experience in the private sector, can you tell us how do digital innovations like cropping drive agricultural transformation and also address climate resilience? Um, and I'd also like just to get your insights. I know this wasn't... Uh, you know, you, you probably in your thinking, but um, many of the conversations we have with the private sector is technologies are expensive. So maybe if you could throw in a little bit of your own thoughts about that. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that point, uh, actually, Dina. So I'll, I'll start with the fact that um, with all the efforts that we're putting in terms of transforming agriculture, being able to build climate resilience, uh, being able to enable the farming communities, to be able to build sustainable livelihoods. If you truly want this to sustain for the long term, digital innovations and adoption of digital has to be at the core. That's the only way we can ensure that, that the knowledge that's being imparted, the practices that are being imbibed, the information and knowledge that is being gathered and made possible through providers like ESA, for example, is democratized and accessible to everyone. Doesn't matter whether it's a male farmer or a female farmer, doesn't matter if it's a small holder farmer or as a large farmer or older farmer, because everyone's getting impacted. And it is critical that that knowledge and know-how is made available to all. And I think that's where digital innovations is going to be at the core. And 
we've been able to see a clear demonstration of this in our experience over the last 13 years. We have till now only touched 7 million farmers. There's still such a huge population out there that we haven't even touched. We've only been able to digitize 30 million acres of land and 200 million acres of land where we have provided predictable intelligence. But there's so much more to be tapped. But what we've clearly seen is when technology is infused into programs at the grassroots level, demonstrable and tangible impact is visible, is recordable, so you can measure, report, and verify, which is an important component of also being able to bring in investments, because then every stakeholder has got transparent visibility into what's happening on the ground. That enables people with financial investment possibilities and capabilities to say, hey, I'm ready to invest because I can see the impact. Also, that ties back into the point that you made on of being expensive. Well, I think that's, that's a myth that we continue to break because as we scale the adoption of these technologies, they automatically start becoming truly, truly accessible in terms of cost. And I think that's where every stakeholder has got a role to play. Uh, I'll just give you examples. It's not just um, uh, program uh, donor uh, participants like IFAD or other players, but also market players. For example, agribusinesses who are private players can play a role in investing in and contributing to this whole adoption of digital. Importantly, if you're enabling market linkages where you can transparently see through the supply chain, financial participants like banks, insurance companies will be more than happy to come in because today they are struggling with the whole challenge of information asymmetry, which doesn't enable them to build really custom products for the farmers based on their profiles, based on historic information because there is lack of information. All of these participants together can truly enable A, be able to diffuse uh, and subsidize a lot of the cost of technology right at the beginning. And as the adoption of technology scales, it becomes possible for providers like Cropin to really reduce the scale uh, of the investments that we have to make because the scale increases. And this is a classic use case that has been proven by public cloud technologies that is now globally uh, adapted. So I think we have a model of how technology can be made cheaper, accessible to everyone. We just have to ensure that we bring in more of the ecosystem players to play an active role. And I think, again, it will be enabled by digital at the core, without which the lack of transparency is only going to keep these participants away. No, that's really important, actually. And, and I think I take away from what you're saying is that, um, and I like the word democratization of access to technology, because again, this has been an inhibiting factor for many, especially smallholders. Because more and more, you know, you try, you, we try as development actors to understand why after all these investments, they're still, you know, uh, susceptible and vulnerable to all the conditions, climatic conditions. And they, we try to build their resilience, but still, you know, um, even with the technology, they're always caught by surprise. So so I, I, I would like to, to see more of this uh, uh, happening. Uh, let me turn to you, uh, Dr. Amplazis. Um, you're in your role at ICARDA, how do you see digital innovations impacting agricultural research? and development in Africa and Asia in particular. And also, what strategies are you employing in ICARDA uh, and the other partners that you work with uh, to ensure that digital solutions are inclusive and accessible to smallholder farmers? A million dollar question. <laughs> I will start from um, when Louis Armstrong landed on the moon. He sent a very short message <clears throat> to the ground and saying, this is a gigantic technological step, but a very small step in the journey of human humanity. To say this, I just want to enter into the issue of technology and innovation. I think innovation is much more important than technology, how we are going to package it, how we are going to use it, and, 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 and so forth. Many people are talking about now, we need to act within the natural boundaries in agriculture and other issues. But what are the natural boundaries? As far as I'm concerned is how far we can stretch our ability to innovate and link theory to practice. These, um, I will use this to enter into your question now. Ikara definitely is not now debating on the importance of 
digital technology or not, because now we passed that, how well we can innovatively use it to help the small farmers in Africa and, and Asia. There are two dimensions here. We are talking about integration and partnership. Many people have uh, 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 mentioned it. The South, the North South, Frank has elaborated on it very well. Also, my colleague has talked about it under the, 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 um, the video. However, the vertical integration, which means effective partnership of public, private, producer, and consumers, in most of the cases, are lacking. The researchers will be sitting down in their cocoon of research, and then they generate, I mean, amazing technologies and put it in the shelves what we call the supermarket uh, approach. So there is no scaling. And uh, of course, the public is doing something and the, the private are focusing on what is profitable also. And they are very good in scaling, uh, but the public sector are not very good in scaling. Because the public sector uh, 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 players, they get their salaries from the from the from the treasury, I mean, it doesn't matter what what they do at the end of the day. For the private sector, either they regenerate and recover their investment from the clients, or they close. Now, there are huge opportunities in the digital farming. I come to now uh, the end of your question: what Ikara is doing in Tunisia? Um, we had a project, and it's still going on. Where are we just bought, bought messages from the the company um, about 5,000 messages a day and send it to all the farmers, which tells them where to get inputs, where to sell their outputs, where are the markets, and, 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 and so forth. Here in the GCC, where I'm coordinating a project with the GCC um, countries, we have developed a mobile app where we are trying to get the farmers contribute to controlling and monitoring of, of, of pests. The farmers can go and tell the extension and the extension can tell the researchers and then the researchers can also inform the extension, extension inform also the farmers, and the cycle is completed of what is happening in different fields. I mean, there are a lot of other things. We are here in UAE also de developing what we call um, decision support system, which helps farm 21,000 farmers on 51 crops, where we are collecting information and disseminating it in a daily basis. The farmers can just use their mobile phone have access to extension information that they can use. They can take their mobile and uh, put it against a leaf which has got some diseases, and then that goes to a server, and then they come and say this is deficiency of phosphorus, for example, or it is a virus, and this is what you have to do to resolve it. The, the, the technologies are there. But the innovation definitely and the integration vertically and, and, and horizontally needs more work. Thank you so much for, for demystifying also the the research, you know, complexity that people tend to think, you know, researchers are, are just, a, sorry to say, a group of nerds sitting there, you know, in their labs and and uh, it doesn't have a real application in the real world. And, and as you said, this integration amongst the various actors is extremely important. Um, so I want to know if uh, Professor Yuxel is still with us. Uh, is he connected? Did he manage to connect? Okay. Professor, are you with us? Hello? Professor, hello? No, he's not connected. Okay. I think this is still quite a rich show. Let me turn to you then, Frank. I'm going to, again, you know, listening to our two colleagues and panelists here um, and your work as well, I'm just wondering, um, you presented to us quite fascinating, um, you know, technologies and satellite uh, imagery, but what was the real challenges for you in applying these 
sort of technologies very advanced to this uh, agricultural space. What were some of the challenges that you faced in the very beginning? Well, uh, we can be excellent in one field, and that is for us the building of the satellites. But other partners are excellent in their field. I, I'm really fascinated about uh, this last mile of information, how it comes to the individual farmer. I'm, uh, I'm really encouraged by the work of the private sector uh, in bringing this information to its platforms, uh, prov uh, provi uh, adjusting it and uh, disseminating uh, this work. From the public sector, uh, I said we are building a satellites here. We are, uh, but we are partnering with IFAD, with other, with uh, the World Bank, with international uh, financial institutions, uh, with UNEP, with national institution. Uh, governments don't have to look for a profit; they can have a long-term vision, and the, a long-term vision is what we need to. Uh, to tackle this crisis. We can, uh, these satellite data are uh, made to be as well available in the next decades. So one can build, and that means the private sector can build on it. Uh, the, uh, the farmer can rely that this type of information transfer, uh, transformed towards his specific need will be as well available tomorrow the day after, for the next year, and so on. Related to climate resilience, yes, we have technology, uh, we have to bring it together. If everybody is acting on its own, we will never solve it. We have to work together. And that's why we are here, working together to tackle this immense task. No, absolutely, thank you so much. And, and uh, you know, I uh, keep hearing this word of we, you know, we have to work together. We're always, you know, you hear it from every, not just from those in the private sector, you hear it. Yes. Uh, uh, from, our, from our ESA, we're having programs to support the research. We are pr having programs to support the application of the findings of the research. And we are having programs to uh, facilitate uh, the uh, dissemination, capacity building into uh, in developing countries. And uh, we are doing this together with partners and we see this as the only way uh, to succeed. Oh, excellent, thank you so much for that. So uh, Sujit, just to um, get from you a sense of how, you know, you're working in this sector for a long time and um, what would be, in your opinion, uh, the most challenging way to, to democratize this? Uh, what, what would be your main obstacle going forward? I, so this is from the experience grounds up. One is um, resistance to change. And this is one industry, as in, and this was one of the questions that almost flummoxed me when I came across Cropin and this challenge that it was trying to address in agriculture. Why is this sector the last sector to adopt digital? Uh, this should have been the first sector. This impacts the whole planet. It impacts the human race. So why haven't we solved this first rather than solving for probably grocery and e-commerce and so on and so forth? And, and it all boiled down to that because it's at planet scale, we've got billions of human lives that it touches directly and indirectly. Uh, driving change is challenging. So resistance to change is, is number one. And I think the way we've been working to tackle really is education at the grassroots level. And I think that's where partners like IFAD and everyone else, including public sector, governments, for example, uh, building education programs on how digital adoption can tangibly show benefits to growers and farmers at the grassroots level is super critical. Most important part, and that's the role that we are playing as private players is, can we reduce the time to show impact? Because otherwise, um, it's very difficult for someone to sustain a change practice that you're driving mm -hmm. as part of a program. So our goal is, if someone deploys a technological solution, can we show them the impact, say in days and not in weeks and months? And that is important, where they see that, hey, it's really easy for me to use, I can integrate it into my daily life and practices, I don't have to go and change the way I've been doing things. 
Um, I can speak with it in my local language. I can consume information in my local language. I don't have to go and learn something new again. Um, it doesn't matter whether you've done uh, a practice in the past. It makes it easy for you to understand instructions coming your way and so on and so forth. The second uh, challenge that we clearly see is the digital divide, which is um, there are folks who have got access to technology, internet connectivity, and then there are folks who don't. And I think that's where, again, the whole ecosystem has to come together to build infrastructure. We are doing our bid as private players by making technology that does not require high-end infrastructure. Low connectivity areas, we can still make the technology work. Even if you go to offline, where there's no remote, uh, uh, there is no connectivity, the applications still work. You can still do your work, et cetera. You can take data with you, be able to use that information, et cetera. Right. We're also trying to make it uh, make the solutions workable on smartphones that are really low end and so on and so forth. That's our bit of what we are trying to do. Uh, but there's so much more that we need to do to build the entire digital infrastructure. I think these are the two elements that really are the challenges that we need to drive. And I think uh, engaging community is another important part. And we have seen the, the best program framework is where we build agripreneurs and village-based advisors as the owners of the change in villages. Uh, and not us, uh, and that is critical. Make them the champions. Make them from the community the champions who really drive this change and sustain this change. And I think that's the way to go in the long run. Thank you so much for that. So I see we are really approaching, I don't want to even try to summarize that, but definitely the digital divide and also trying to make sure that the behavioral change that is required um, from communities, and we know development is a long-term sustainable uh, path that needs to be maintained. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to these panels, and as you heard from also uh, my colleague Sarah uh, from the previous session, if there are any questions, and I see the lady, uh, and then, um, so we just have the lady, the gentleman at the back, and then um, uh, Ms. Fatima in the front. Thank you. Thank you, Kenya, very much, the University of Arizona. First of all, I would like to express appreciation to our experts and I would like to ask you um, about your insights on the current situation. Do you feel we have overabundance of the data and information or do we have the deficit of information and data in order to make the decision? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the way we, um, the speed at which we generate information and the, the speed at which we bundle them into, into innovation and then scale them is much slower than the way the, um, the target um, uh, audience are taking them and then using them. We all know the natural distribution of adoption. Three percent are uh, very adventurous pioneers. Three percent are laggards. And in the middle, I mean, the 96 percent are very slow uh, adopting. Because we are talking about the livelihood of the person. If you go to a farmer and you say, I mean, change the variety you are using for the last 25 years or so forth with this new variety and he was not involved in the development, he would say, okay, I'm not going to be the first one. So to come to your question, there are a lot of information, but definitely I think a little of it is already implemented at, at, at the level. I mean, whether, whether the, 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 the issue if is a, a decision making, whether, okay, this is what we have, let us use it or not, I don't think it is, it, it is that. It is a matter of technology in the generation and somebody who's investing on it for his own livelihood so the process in nature is very slow. But we have a lot of information. Yeah, I, the only point that I'll add is yes, there is a lot of information and data available. Uh, the gap besides the challenge that uh, Dr. mentioned is uh, the fact that we don't have enough correlation of all this information and data. Uh, all of them are sitting in silos, either with the public sector, in some case with development agencies, some with private players like us. 
there is nothing that's connecting all of this information and data. So that becomes easy for us to correlate, not just the causal effect, but also, hey, if we change this, what will happen? And being able to communicate that then transparently to the grassroots level to drive change upwards. I think that's the challenge. Technologies are there. We need to make technologies accessible, relevant. Those are still challenges. Um, we still have a long way to go on those fronts too. Yeah, it's, it's well related. Uh, I think we have a, there's a lot of information. We have to connect it. We have to make it accessible, as you uh, just said. And uh, but whenever you have some information, you will still identify gaps, which need to be addressed as well. So, but my feeling currently, we ha uh, we have overall a lot of information, and what we need now is action. We, kn we all know since decades that the CO2 level is rising in the atmosphere. We heard over the last 30 years at COPS we have to act on it. The only thing what I see still is a rising curve of, of CO2, that's the, uh, the greenhouse gases, the rising curve of the temperature above the pre-industrial level. We have to act towards the 1.5 goal. We will get additional information, we get more, but now it's the time for action. Well, thank you very much. Um, I like okay, thank you. Yes, I have a question for Alex. I don't know whether he's still there. I think also it can apply to ICADA. One of the beneficiary of the mobile extension driven messages are mobile service providers and sometimes banks. To what extent are they involved as part of sustainability? Because I would imagine banks are benefiting as well as financial service providers because so much airtime is going to be bought by farmers as they are part of the platform. To what extent are they part of so that it becomes sustainable? And then for crop in, from your video you showed us uh, it's more like a monocrop, one crop just being to what extent is technology assisting diversity? Because I'm sure we, we have the evidence showing that monoculture is not going to solve our climate problems. Uh, how are you taking care of crop diversity? Thank you. Hello? Hello? Alex, please, could you, did you hear the question? Yes, yes very good. Uh, I want to respond to, to, to the question uh, on uh, the, 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 the role of service provider. Yes, uh, this is a shared uh, responsibility and of course they get subsidized. Uh, they pay part of it because we send, uh, they pay part of the service and even the system development is also part of the their contribution to this. So the monocrop, no. Uh, the monocrop, uh, that was uh, just a de a depiction of uh, an happy farmer. We promote um, in the crop uh, for uh, the intervention. And then just to provide the uh, one minute on the question on uh, do we have an uh, overbalance uh, of a supply of data? So the information has been there, it will be there. And it will continue to be there. So uh, it's only late. It's only now we are realizing we have too much. Uh, and the reason is the ability and technology. It's only yesterday, it's only this uh, recent years we have realized we have too much because of the ability of the iPhones, Android. So what is uh, missing here is, uh, and also the challenges. You know, challenges bring uh, unseen uh, an opportunity and explo unexploited. So we have uh, too much, but if knowledge also, if also technology continues to evolve, we'll also realize we have even too much. We, we are not even utilizing. So technology will also give birth to, we have too much. And that's the essence of uh, development. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, so um, when you look at the deployment of technology from a perspective of monocropping versus intercropping, and intercropping is going to be the way forward, especially in smallholder farmer patterns, we clearly see that. That's where if you're just depending on something like remote sensing technologies like satellite, it still doesn't solve for it. But that's where we combine digitization at the grassroots level, which is enabling farmers to digitize all that they're doing, and then bring in remote sensing capabilities where you're at least able to give them inputs in terms of weather-related impact, when weather changes are being forecasted, and what could be the impact on the crops that they're growing. And it doesn't have to be monocrop, by the way. But uh, if you're looking at only purely using remote sensing technologies, uh, which is really scalable, uh, which really doesn't depend on anything being done on ground by growers and farmers, et cetera, in terms of digitizing what they're doing, in which case monocropping is the only problem statement that we're able to solve for, or use case we're able to solve for. But intercropping, combined digitization with remote sensing is possible, and that's what we're doing in a lot of markets, uh, like Latin America, like India, like Africa. Uh, thank you so much for this insight uh, session. I am Fatma Hassan, National Convener of Sudan Food System. Uh, my question is that in Sudan, we have an annual assessment about the growing uh, season. We use satellite image. Uh, it gives green color. But when, when we come to cross-check with the ground at the ground level, uh, it is not crops. Uh, sometimes you find grasses, sometimes you find an unuseful uh, vegetation. Uh, my question is that, is there any advanced uh, satellite imagery that can give us the type of crop, the growing index, and all these factors? Uh, and uh, uh, the second question may be a stupid question <laughs> to you as digital people. Uh, is this satellite imagery affected by, for example, the clouds, if there is rain, if there is moisture uh, in, the, in the atmosphere? Thank you so much. Well, okay. Uh, starting with the last one, uh, the satellite images in the optical scheme, that means uh, in the band uh, where we are seeing things as well with, your, uh, with our eyes, uh, that is affected by clouds. That is the case for Sentinel-2. Sentinel-1 is a radar satellite which looks through the clouds. And uh, so you, and what we are doing is combining the information of both uh, to have uh, a continuous flow of information. And when there is no uh, optical uh, data available, uh, then it's complemented by the radar uh, data to give uh, a continuous flow of information which is necessary to see the growth of uh, the plants uh, uh, in the agriculture sector. Uh, the analysis method with uh, better technology, artificial intelligence, the cloud computing which is enabling as well uh, that uh, the information uh, can be uh, uh, created uh, uh, from out uh, countries which don't have the supercomputing uh, uh, at, ho uh, at home. Uh, the information uh, related to the crops, the status, the health status of the crop is increasing with the development of these algorithms. Uh, working, but only working together, let's say, with the local uh, population with the people who are knowing their land and giving example can, who, which can train the algorithm. Uh, this dialogue needs to uh, happen to improve even further the algorithm. We have systems like the World Cereal System which is looking at uh, uh, different types of crops all over the globe. But to make it more adjusted towards your local uh, circumstances. This dialogue, this information from the ground needs, needs to be brought together and then you will have an additional level of information. Thank you so much. No, I'm really sorry, although I wanted to stretch 
as far as possible to allow us to, uh, to engage in this very exciting conversation. I also see Professor Yuxel joined us. I'm very sorry I will ha not have be able to give you the floor because we're uh, already in another, entering into another session. Uh, but I'd like to really thank um, the, you know, the distinguished panelists, all who have joined us today, your, for your interest in joining us. If you have follow-up questions, I'm sure you can accost them in the corridors or just outside, but uh, please join me in, in really uh, thanking our panelists and giving them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.